The city of Iquitos on the Amazon River is home to some half a million people. Surrounded by water and rainforest, it's the biggest city in the world that can't be accessed by road. People who can't afford air travel or have too much luggage can only reach the city by boat, if at all. Once we were stuck for three days. We had to wait on the ship until the water rose high enough. The Peruvian government has plans to change that situation. The Hidrovia project involves dredging the Amazon's tributaries to create a multinational network of deep water highways that can be navigated by big ships all year round. It will improve the transportation of goods, but local people will also benefit. But many of the people who live here are skeptical. All too often in the past, they've seen promises of development only bring them hardship. Who does the river belong to? Our journey is full of encounters with magical river spirits, but primarily with people for whom life by the river means everything. Ludwig is a porter. He's glad to have the work, but it's a back-breaking job. A sack of rice on your back weighs 50 kilos, so that's 100 kilos for two sacks. Every day, we unload a truck full, which adds up to several tons. Ludwig and his colleagues spend about three hours loading and unloading. Then they have to take a break. It takes quite a while to load up a boat this size. We're in the port city of Yurimaguas. This is where the road ends. Everything that needs transporting to Iquitos or even further to Brazil has to be packed onto boats. The Eduardo III is an aging cargo ship that also transports passengers. This is the only large boat that will be setting off from Yurimaguas over the next few days. While the workers load the last sacks and boxes of cargo on board, the harbour master talks optimistically about the future. We'll see progress here soon. Peruvian and Brazilian and all other boats passing through here will be able to travel in all seasons and with more cargo. The harbour master dreams of one day seeing a fully fledged container terminal here. That's what the Peruvian government is planning, although so far there's only a promotional video. The Hidrovia is a sprawling infrastructure project involving the dredging of three major tributaries of the Amazon. The aim is to create shipping channels that are at least 56 meters wide and deep enough for larger ships. A Chinese company is set to begin work soon. Initial investments amount to just under $100 million. The additional costs for expanding and maintaining harbor facilities along nearly 3,000 kilometers of river are nearly impossible to estimate. We're building an expansive system of shipping waterways that will open up new opportunities. Right now, when the water level is low, ships can only operate during the day, not at night. This project will significantly improve transportation links. But that's all in the future. For the time being, traders and passengers remain dependent on boats like the Eduardo III. It will take three days and three nights to make it to Iquitos, assuming nothing goes wrong. Sein Perez is the ship's captain. He's been sailing the Amazon for 25 years. For him, it's not just a job, but a calling. Navigating your way along these rivers is a real art. 
viene de herencia. I inherited the talent from my father. Soy el único. I'm his only son to have carried on the tradition. And I hope the generation after me will continue it too. Mi generación que viene de repente también va a ser a seguir. It means a lot to me. Igual que para mí. Significa mucho. These days, Captain Perez doesn't spend much time at the helm. He now has other people to do that job for him. Like Walter Salazar, who's also been on the job for decades. Sailing on such shallow waters takes a great deal of experience. You have to be familiar with the river and keep a lookout for shifting sandbanks. They're really dangerous. If you run into one, anything can happen. The ship can capsize. Smaller boats are at an advantage in the shallow waters, but they're mainly used for shorter distances. They're essentially river buses. The tickets are expensive, and there's a limit on how much luggage you can take on board. The ferries make frequent stops along the shore, seemingly in the middle of nowhere, to pick up or drop off passengers. Israel Galliano lives in the Peruvian capital, Lima, with his children and his wife, Adriana. The family is going to visit Israel's parents, who live in the town of Lagunas, deep in the Amazon. Israel hasn't been home in 15 years. I'm going to introduce my family to my parents. I want my wife and children to see where I grew up. I want to show them our customs and what life is like in the Amazon. It's lovely here. So much nature and no air pollution. It's so loud in the city. Here you feel much more free. I love that. Adriana does admit she feels a bit uneasy. She's nervous about her first meeting with her parents-in-law, but also about the water. This is the first time I've been on a boat, so I am a bit afraid. But I'm sure that we'll arrive safely. They'll be spending a few weeks in Lagunas. Compared to the city, it's a different world. They're welcomed with fresh fruit. Israel and Adriana's young son seems to be taking it all in his stride. It's been a long journey. Once the bags are loaded, the family heads off. Meanwhile, at the small harbor in Lagunas, locals await the arrival of the Eduardo III. A snack stand serves up Juanes, rice with meat and fish wrapped in banana leaves. It's a popular snack at all times of day. If you prepare it today, it's still good and tasty for another one or two days. You eat it cold. Once everyone's eaten, it's time for a game of football by the river. The players are amateurs, but the commentator has the trappings of a pro. Back on board the Eduardo III, passengers swap stories of the Amazon. Francisca Hidalgo is on her way to see her family in Iquitos. She's looking forward to the new river highway. On past journeys, the boat was often left stranded. The woman in the hammock next to her is on a special mission and hopes she won't fall behind schedule. We're here on behalf of the Education Ministry to bring mattresses and beds to remote Amazon villages. 
Once the ship has docked, the porters bring the supplies donated by the government onto shore, even if no one really seems to have been waiting for them. Relations between local people and the central government are strained. Many local people are part of the indigenous community or have indigenous roots. They've suffered a long history of persecution and injustice and are still discriminated against. Leonida Pakaya is a member of the Kukama people. She's one of the last who still speak the Kukama language. That means, how are you and where are you from? Leonida has a visitor today. Casilda Pinche is an activist who's committed to preserving Kukama culture. She fears that the government's new infrastructure projects will do lasting damage. The new technology and the machines they'll bring in will have a devastating impact. It will destroy a lot of things. The river means life for us and for the animals. The water is everything here. It's as important as having air to breathe. For the Kukama people, the rivers and lakes of the Amazon are central to their culture. In the Kukama religion, there is another world underwater where their ancestors gather. People, animals, spirits all live together underwater. For the Kukama, any harm that comes to the rivers and lakes destroys everything. Casilda runs a painting school. The pictures she and her students paint depict the underwater world of the Kukama, a world full of myths, spirits and colourful creatures. This is about a legend of the Parawa. The Parawa is home to all living beings in the depths of the river. Without it, there would be no river and no fish. The Parawa is a house, but it's a house that looks like a snake, like a boa. For the Kukama, these creatures of the river are best left undisturbed. The massive Itruvia project would invade their spiritual realm. But the protests against the new water highway also have a very practical dimension. Just look at the course of the river, says Casilda Pinche, and you'll see that dredging and channeling are a bad idea. The river here is constantly changing. The old people say that as well. A small stream will grow large and split up again. It's best not to interfere. Many leading scientists also have reservations about the project. Environmental engineer Jorge Abad has spent years researching the Amazon. He says the network of waterways here has shifted constantly for millions of years. We have plenty of, uh, let's say, different rivers, small rivers, large rivers, one that transport more sediments than others, and uh, one that are more dynamic than others, and we never have done a characterization of these rivers. So we don't know enough. He evaluates samples and satellite images and takes measurements of the waterways. But it's a time-consuming process, and he says the government doesn't want to wait for the results of his research. But the government's own studies are inadequate. Are commercial interests simply too powerful? Basically, I mean, what I feel is that they, they are blind. Sometimes I think they want to remain blind because, uh, you know, if we do a really nice research here, that may be showing that maybe you don't need to dredge. 
or maybe naturally the river is going to, you know, basically erosion by itself. Dredging the river at the wrong place could have disastrous consequences, he says, upsetting the ecological balance and endangering biodiversity. Jorge says the hidrovia could have benefits in theory by focusing on expanding the use of existing waterways rather than building new roads, it could help prevent deforestation. But badly implemented, the Hidrovia project could be a nightmare. All this isn't relevant to the operators of the Eduardo III right now. They just want to transport their cargo as quickly as possible, get it unloaded, and continue on their way. This time, the porters were surprisingly quick. While she was handing out the mattresses, Susanna Yayi missed the ship's departure. But a boat brings her back on board. For some, the most important section of the ship is the kitchen, where Martin and Ayosebio are in charge. The 20 euro ticket includes three meals a day. Passengers have to bring their own plates and bowls. Today, a stew is on the menu. <laughs> For us, the job means getting to know the entire Amazon region, all the different villages, and above all, making a lot of new friends. The crews of the cargo ships take pride in their knowledge of the rivers and also of the people who live there. The arrival of the Eduardo III is always a major event. It's not just goods that arrive, the ship also brings the latest news, gossip and rumors. There's very limited cellular coverage here, so these conversations are also a lifeline for the community. We're always on the move. We now know practically everyone living by the shore. We've known them forever, and we get on really well with everyone. Captain Sain Perez has mixed feelings about the plans for the river highway. He understands the reservations of the people who are critical of the project, but welcomes the idea of progress. For him personally, the project means he might one day be able to captain bigger and more modern ships up and down the river. I'd like that. I want to move on and further my career. I'm not happy making do with what I can already do. I want to develop. <laughs> it's the second night on our journey. It's crowded below deck. The mattresses brought along by Susanna Yayi as donations come in handy. But while the passengers get some rest down below, the crew up on the bridge have to be on high alert. It's not easy. It's extremely dark, with a lot of rain and fog. I'd planned to be faster than this. But now we're behind schedule. But I guess we'll be arriving in Nauta at 10 in the morning. As dawn breaks and the passengers wake up, the jungle is now visible again by the shore. And a couple of hours later, Nauta also comes into view. This is where the Marañón and Ucayali converge and form the river that from this point is officially called the Amazon. The main road in Nauta is where the Radio Ukamara offices are located. The local broadcaster is also a popular meeting place and informal community center for indigenous people. The Hidrovia project is a major topic of conversation, as is their own identity. 
When we make our personal stories public, these aren't just personal stories. They're also part of the history shared by our community, all the people in our lives. It has a huge communicative power and gives us strength. Leonardo Tello says that strength and courage are two things that people here need. My father died two years ago, at the age of 99. He was one of the last slaves to toil away here during the rubber boom. We were unaware of this when we were kids. But when we started listening to the radio and hearing bad stories from other people, we asked our parents about their stories. And then we heard about things that were really traumatic. From rubber and gold to wood and crude oil, the history of the exploitation of people and nature along the Amazon goes back a long way, in Peru and the region as a whole. Leonardo believes that the memories of this suffering are still affecting people today. Nauta has a high suicide rate, especially among young people. The pain felt by victims in the past is passed on from one generation to the next. That's what we believe here. The same applies to the inability to talk about bad experiences. That might be why so many people today take their own lives. The next morning, Leonardo and a few colleagues head out onto the river to reach the tributaries where the jungle comes right up to the water's edge. They conduct research and talk to other activists about their latest findings. Among them is filmmaker Pedro Pinedo. He's traveling through the Amazon region to talk to local people, while also using his camera to document environmental pollution. Oil extraction in the area is a major polluter. Many of the pipelines leak. Pedro will use his video footage to show that pipeline maintenance and cleanup operations are not working nearly as well as the government claims. Here in the middle of my country, in Peru, we're confronted with a reality where there's nothing other than pollution. There's no drinking water, and that makes me afraid. You can die if you drink the water here. Pedro accuses the government of putting profit before people in the region. He doesn't believe things will be any different with the Amazon infrastructure project. Sure, they tell us how things will improve. The government says the big ships coming up here from other countries will buy our products. But that's not how things will be. Nobody's going to stop here to buy our fish. It's all disinformation. The government rejects these accusations, saying that the Hidrovia will also benefit local communities. The indigenous people will benefit enormously. It will help them get around quicker when going to the doctor, for example. The new infrastructure will make a lot of things easier. But we do have to remember that we'll have a lot of work explaining the project to people. Leonardo and his team believe that government representatives have not been taking them seriously. They want to see respect for Mother Nature and for their culture and religious beliefs. If you disturb the river, you destroy everything. The balance between the world underwater and the villages by the riverbank is under threat. We live up here, our ancestors down below, like a family. He and his fellow activists realize their protest is unlikely to win over the people in charge. But they are determined to continue their resistance. This rap song says the river is our queen. It's a declaration of love to their treasured river and of their hope that it will be preserved. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Eduardo III is on the final daytime stage of its trip. It started raining again. 
That doesn't bother Francisca or the other passengers who are staying dry. As long as it rains, the river will not subside. Water levels will remain high enough to keep the ship afloat rather than foundering on a sandbank. After three days and three nights, the Eduardo III reaches Iquitos and gets a grand welcome. It's time for the porters to unload all the cargo. Captain Perez and his crew have once again mastered the tricky currents, even managing to make up time for the brief holdup. It's been their fastest trip for quite a while. We've arrived safely. The ship is securely moored, and nothing bad happened. And that's the most important thing for me. Just a few kilometers from the harbor, but a world away, is the promenade of Iquitos. The more expensive restaurants are popular with the tourists. Almost all of them come here by air, so they have little feel for the vast expanse of the Amazon River and its tributaries. It's lunchtime at the Fitzcarraldo, a restaurant run by Carlos Manuel Köhler, a Peruvian with German roots. The name comes from the Werner Herzog movie Fitzcarraldo. It was shot here in Iquitos in 1980. It's a film about an eccentric European businessman obsessed with bringing opera to the Amazon, played by maverick German actor Klaus Kinski. Today, Iquitos is home to people who have built an entire city in the middle of the jungle. Home to nearly half a million people with no roads connecting it to the outside world. Iquitos's residents are proud of the bustling market square on the shore of the largest river on the planet. If the government's controversial plans go ahead, Iquitos will continue to grow and become the main trading hub between Brazil and Peru. The Itrovia project is set to create a new commercial corridor linking the Atlantic with the Pacific. For China and other global players, that's an appealing prospect. The fight for the future of the Amazon continues. For now, all that Captain Perez knows for certain is that he will set off again in a few days' time with a ship loaded with cargo, passengers and stories. We're just regular people going about our work. As soon as our next job comes in, we set sail, and then we'll be back on the river.